welcome to 2021. <laughs> uh, it is so good to be out of last year. Not that everything will suddenly be perfect, but that uh, um, it's just a new year to hope, at least. <laughs> Let's go at it from that direction. I hope you had a, a, a good holiday, even if it was a different kind of holiday, as it was for pretty much all of us along the way. Um, drinking coffee this morning with my uh, Christmas vacation mug. You know, can I refill your eggnog, get you something to eat, drive you out to the middle of nowhere and leave you for dead? I'm sorry. <laughs> I, most, if you know me, you know I have that kind of sarcastic wit about me. So I, uh, um, I just thought I would share it today. I felt like I needed to. It is great that you have joined me today, or whatever day you come to here to, uh, to get together for our Bible study. I want to um, share with you that we are going to um, start a new Bible study, uh, a book of the Bible today. Uh, a letter, if you will, uh, one of my favorite letters in the uh, New Testament, and that is Philippians. Now, if you had ever gone to seminary or knew someone who went went to seminary and, and uh, worked on their MDiv, one of the things that you had to take uh, was languages. Oh, what a horrible thing. And you could choose to take uh, two semesters of, well, you could choose more if you wanted, but you took two semesters of Greek or Hebrew and one semester of the other. And I took two semesters of Greek and um, one semester of Hebrew. One was all I could handle with Hebrew. But um, uh, one of the things that you end up doing in this Greek study class, uh, language class, is uh, translating. And so one of the things that you almost always are asked to translate uh, is Philippians. That's your major project in a sense through uh, um, the syntax uh, thing. So I also, we also did Revelation one through three. Um, but uh, it, basically Greek teachers choose that because Philippians is pretty well written. Uh, and what I mean by that is the the grammar is is you know, pretty top notch, uh, at least in Greek, and it is um, a little bit easier to translate uh, with the nuances of of uh, words and meanings and so forth. So uh, that's one of the reasons they give you that. But uh, what I would like to do in our study is we're going to start with Philippians. We're going to have a little introduction today and get into the first chapter today, at least. Uh, but I, I want you to use your Bible, but I want you to know that I'm going to be reading from uh, the translation I did way back when. This would have been circa 1987. Uh, yeah, it's it's yellow only because that's the color of the paper, not because it's that old. Uh, but uh, nonetheless, it is, um, uh, you know, it's, it's, I, I hope to share it with you, and maybe we'll dig some things out of uh, the the work, the text of the scripture that we didn't know before or we hadn't noticed before. Or maybe something new will jump out and speak to us along the way. So I hope that uh, that you're prepared for that uh, as uh, we are going to look at Philippians. So let's dive right in, uh, if you don't mind. And as I said before, I hope you all had a wonderful Christmas. By the way, before we do dive in, uh, in the church calendar, you know, uh, Advent, Lent, Pentecost, etc. Uh, today is actually the day that is known as the Epiphany of the Lord, and it is a celebrated day. It is, uh, uh, it is 12 days after uh, the birth of Christ, and it is uh, to denote uh, the Magi coming to uh, see the uh, child Jesus in relayed to us in Matthew 2, and the reason of its significance is that it is um, held up as significant because the light has come to the whole world, that God has come uh, with his hope of salvation 
not just for Jews, his the Jews, his Hebrews, the, his chosen children, but for all of us are his chosen children now, Gentiles and Hebrew alike. So today was Epiphany. I mean, we kind of celebrated Sunday because it was the Sunday closest, but the 6th of January is always the Epiphany of the Lord. Uh, so thought you would want to remember that a little bit. We're going to talk about Philippians. So let me give you some background. Where in the world is this place? Well, it's in that that um, part of the Mediterranean uh, towards Asia, in, in uh, that Greek Asia Minor area and theater through there. Um, the city itself that is known as Philippi was founded uh, around 358 BC. It was founded and named for uh, its founder who was uh, Philip II of Macedonia. And that should probably tell you something. Uh, if you know a little bit of your history there, uh, you're dealing with um, the Philip that uh, united the Greek states into a Greek uh, empire, into a Greek uh, country or nationality, if you will. Um, they basically he forms the process of a monarchy out of all the city states that made up what we know as Greece. And uh, Philip the second is uh, a Corinthian, uh, which was very rare. Uh, most of the leaders of the Greeks came, or the ones we think most of, came from Athens or came from Sparta. Most people know about the Spartans, um, but in this case, Philip came from Corinth and. Uh, Philip would unite them, and then his son would do even better. You knew him as Alexander, and Alexander, after Philip was assassinated, becomes pushed into the kingly role of the Greek city-states, and in a youthful, well, relatively youthful age, uh, he leads the largest uh, known empire land-wise in the history of the ancient world. Uh, it was actually Greece, not Rome. Um, but the, um, uh, he would push the Greece, em, Grecian Empire all the way to India, uh, including you know, conquering Egypt and all sorts of lands between there and so forth. Um, Philippi was a mining town. They had gold mines uh, nearby. And it was also agrarian. It had a farming community uh, that thrived around it. Um, years would go by, and in the time of Paul, it is the time of the Roman Empire, and Philippi is not diminished in any way. Uh, it becomes its own province, if you will, um, and it sits on a very important road. It was called by the Romans the Via Ignatia, uh, which was uh, the highway that connected the east to the west, uh, that connected outwards towards Asia to eastwards towards Rome, and Europe. So it was a very important crossroads place. Uh, it would also hold history uh, for the Romans in another way. It would be the place where you may recall a guy named Julius Caesar. Um, Julius Caesar was assassinated in 44 BC by a group of conspirators, Brutus, Cassius, and, and the like. Um, and the result uh, was not long after a civil war to control uh, Rome. Uh, it pitted Cassius, Brutus, and the other conspirators and their legions of armies against uh, a coalition of Mark Anthony, who was the right-hand man of uh, Caesar, Julius Caesar, of course, played by many of you enjoying him, uh, Richard Burton in the Cleopatra movie. Um, but it was also a, a very important uh, alliance with um, uh, Caesar's nephew, who was Augustus. And Augustus, uh, or Octavian really, was his, his, his actual name. Octavian uh, was um, the heir of Caesar's, uh, according to Caesar's will. And then they joined another Roman leader uh, by the name of uh, Lepidus. And the three of them met the conspirators' armies at Philippi in 42 BC, and they fought over the course of a few days um, the battle that really changed Rome. Up to that point, Rome had been a republic, 
not just in name, but in practice. The Senate uh, ruled, and the Senate made decisions for the people of Rome. And with the destruction of Brutus and Cassius and the conspirators, um, they formed what history would call the Third Triumvirate. They split the empire amongst Lepidus, Anthony, and and um, Octavian. And those never last long, and they didn't. And the result was that um, uh, Lepidus was soon swept out of the way. And then, of course, in, an, in a later battle, um, Octavian defeats Mark Anthony. And then we all know the story, Cleopatra and Anthony, etc. cetera. Uh, but after that was done, Octavian took in that process Caesar's name. He, because he was his heir, he, he, he wanted to be called Caesar. And that was a political reason, too. He wanted to be identified with Julius because in his death, Julius Caesar, people noted how powerful Rome was with Julius uh, Caesar and his armies and his leadership. And so for the first time, the empire is, is locked into a, an emperor-type role that is more than just window dressing. It's real. And um, so Octavian changes his name to Caesar Augustus. And the result is Augustus rules for many years, brings peace to the Mediterranean in the lands that they've conquered and in no more infighting with each other among the Romans. So Philippi is a very important place. Uh, in fact, after that battle, Augustus uh, rebuilds Philippi with Roman veterans from the fight as well as other Roman veteran soldiers who had fought for Cassius and Brutus, the conspirators. And, you know, when they, when they lost, you know, they were one, they wanted to watch them. So they took the common foot soldiers and they populated the area with them along with, you know, some of Augustus army. And so the result was it grew very uh, largely Philippi did. Uh, it was given legal status, um, uh, to, um, uh, to Rome as a colony. And what that meant was it, they were given the status of blessed by Rome. And, and that meant this, it was treated like it was Roman soil. Now, what did that mean to us? Well, it meant that in Philippi, there was no poll or land tax, uh, which other subjugated areas under the Roman Empire would be subject to. So that's a little bit of background there. It was a, it was a community with a history of worshiping a lot of gods. We call that pantheism uh, and worshiping a lot of things and a lot of gods. And uh, it's also an area that the Jews would populate um, not long, uh, probably not far removed from the time of, of Paul's writing of Philippians. Uh, prior to Paul's writing, uh, there was a fire, a huge fire in Rome and the result and some other problems that occurred. And so at that time, the emperor was Claudius and Claudius said, uh, the Jews are to blame. So everybody that was a Jew was banished from Rome and many of them settled into the Philippi region. Now, why did I tell you all that? Because when Paul would show up later, uh, it would be that bed of Jewish people and history that Paul would find a way to reach out to to form the body of Christ, the church, there in Philippi. The church itself, the first thing we know about it uh, is uh, the book of Acts in the New Testament. Luke wrote the book of Acts, and in the 16th chapter of Acts, we're told that on Paul's um, uh, trip, he shows up there uh, in Philippi, and his only converts are two people that we're told about. The first is a woman by the name of Lydia who was a seller of purple. Uh, and, and basically, it seems that she was a successful businesswoman in a time when women held very little power. And so uh, she was intrigued because she was a Jew. And it was from that uh, basic uh, beginnings of knowing the Torah, knowing the Old Testament, knowing the roots of Yahweh and, and her faith, that Paul was able to convince her that this is uh, the, the natural step is the son of God came to us in Jesus and she believed. And so we're told in Acts 16 that he baptized Lydia and all of her household. 
so there was the beginning of the church, one family, one family unit, uh, with a household that went with it. Now, Paul and Silas, his partner, are later in trouble in Philippi. And the result is that they fall out with the local powers that be, and they're in prison. They're thrown into jail, and you may remember this kind of story. They were put in stocks and chains, and they were made to sit there. But what happened was, uh, all night, they sang praises to God. Uh, and the jailer noticed that. It, it struck a nerve with him, a chord with him. Uh, if you read this story in Acts, and you realize that all of a sudden um, he wants to listen to more of what they've got to say. Well, then a great earthquake happened. And the result was the stocks that held their feet were un undone. The chains came out of the walls. Paul and Silas could run away if they wanted to. And he sees the door open. The jailer runs to their cell. He sees the door open. He fears the worst. They have fled. And if they have fled, then what that means is his life. He might as well end it now because he's going to be held responsible for their um, escape. And he goes to kill himself. And Paul says, whoa, 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 we, we see what you're doing. Don't do that. We're still here. And the jailer is so intrigued by the integrity of Paul and Silas and their actions, both prior to this event and then in the event of not fleeing, that he wants Paul to tell him about this Jesus and he becomes a believer. And then he takes Paul to his home and they all become believers. Now, in Philippi, that those two stories together are very important because it kind of shows that the gospel is not only, first of all, it's, it's still for Jews, which Lydia was, but it's also for Gentiles. We're talking about the epiphany while ago. It's for Gentiles who the jailer was, a Roman Gentile, okay? It's for both of them. The two first converts represent, also represent rich and probably at least on the lower end uh, or the, certainly not a wealthy person, just a common worker. And the good news is for both of them and both of them in their households. So status and wealth are two variables in Roman culture and so here in Philippi, God breaks down these barriers for both, that his good news is for everybody. Uh, these are new waters. Um, in fact, later, uh, when we go into the, the letter of Philippians towards the fourth chapter, we're going to be introduced to some other women, and we're kind of going to realize that in Philippi, at least, there were some women leaders, not just Lydia, but other women leaders in Philippi. Um, and that's the radical good news. Now, the letter, where did it come from, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it kind of from the way you read it, Paul must have been in prison somewhere. Uh, some used to say it was probably towards the end of his life, but we kind of now think it was another imprisonment, one in which he did get released from. And, of course, eventually Paul would end up imprisoned in Rome, and then later he would be beheaded uh, for his faith. Um, but uh, he's probably under tremendous arrest, uh, perhaps waiting a time of trial or a time of acquittal, of which he doesn't know. Um, we're told in the beginning of the letter, in the very first verse, and then later in the second chapter, that Timothy is with Paul. And that, that, that name should ring a bell. There's two letters to Timothy of Paul's towards the end of uh, uh, the New Testament. And the result is that those are kind of, particularly the second one, is probably more in tune with um, the end of Paul's life, so to speak. Um, and Paul is not in Philippi, but he can't wait to get there. This letter is for the Philippians. Um, and so, you know, basically Paul wants to, to get there. It's probably written around approximately 60, 64 AD, uh, give or take, probably more to the 60s, believe that that Paul, tradition has it that Paul was uh, martyred or executed during Nero's reign when Nero went through his purges against uh, the Christians and such. When Rome burned, he had to find somebody to blame, and in this case, he, they blamed the Christians. Um, it, it could very well be the mid-50s, some have speculated. Either way, this is an epistle, by the way, which means it's a letter. If you ever see the word, the epistle of James or the epistle 
to the Corinthians. By the way, another cup of coffee would be good. Um, if you see, the, if you hear that, it just means letter. Much of the New Testament are just that, they're letters. Um, now, what's the difference? Well, a gospel is written more as a narrative. Acts is more of a narrative. But then all of these works of, of Paul, of John, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, of 1st and 2nd Peter, of James, those, and Hebrews, who we don't know who wrote that, uh, um, but all those works really are open letters to the church, usually a specific church, but then they would be copied and interpreted and given, or copied and then sent to other churches uh, along the way. Paul's, um, you know, Hebrews is more like a sermon. These are more like a manual, and, and James is more like a manual of discipline. Um, Paul's letters generally follow a pattern. Uh, he starts with, hey, how are you, in a formal way uh, called a salutation. If you ever watched Charlotte's Web <laughs> or the cartoon or read the book, you know, that's one of those things that um, uh, Charlotte first says to Wilbur the pig, salutations. And uh, it's, it's one of those things, those words that has unfortunately drawn, dropped out of our usage. But, but in Paul's day was, you know, if, if he were speaking English, it, the, the Greek is the same thing. It is a, is a tremendous, it's, it's more than just hello. It's a heartfelt welcome. Then he always usually followed with a thanksgiving and then the body of the letter, usually some type of theological issue or church issue or practical issue. Uh, sometimes he would incorporate what was happening with him, what he wanted to do, where he wanted to go. He would give them some instruction about how they should act. And then there would be a closing. Um, in a sense, Paul often as much as anything, had a ministry in abstentia. And what I mean by that is he would start the church, he would leave after so long, but he wouldn't forget about them. And if he could get back to them and visit them once in a while, that would be great. But in the meantime, he would write them a letter so that he could still have uh, his finger on the pulse of that church and instruct them uh, as he felt led by the Holy Spirit, God telling them that they should be. Uh, letters were personal but they weren't private. In other words, they weren't meant to just be kept by the individual or kept by the church. It was written to be read aloud. Many people had maybe a working knowledge of, uh, you know, language and what have you, but they, they probably, many times, many of the people who made up the church may not have uh, a grasp enough on, on the language that they could uh, understand it to read it aloud or to uh, to share it on their own so the people who were good at the language uh, would read it for the congregation specifically a house church a lot of churches in this time they, they weren't like what we have now of course uh, they met in places away from everyone um, one of the early um, Roman I remember this from church history one of the early Roman um, uh, mentions mentionings of the christians in their faith uh around if i remember right it was around 110 a.d so somewhere in there it was um uh how could i forget his name it started with a p um it was a Pliny. i think that's it Pliny the younger wrote to his superior and in speaking about these followers of christ he said that they would meet on the first day of the week before dawn at, or at dawn and would sing songs and talk with one another and then go about their business and their day. So he describes an early act of worship. It would be in a place that they had said they would meet at or a house in which people would meet at. Um, so why did Paul write this? That's the next thing I wanna look at real quick and then we'll get into it. Well, some feel that Paul sensed um, that since he had left, there was beginning to be fractures in the fellowship at Philippi. A disunity was starting to form. Um, and Paul, in this letter, handles it pretty mildly from Paul's standards. One of the things, if you read Paul's letters, is that Paul can be very abrasive. 
uh, matter of fact, and even hostile. I mean, go read the Corinthians and you get a good look at what that looks like. Um, but with the Philippians, it seems he's very m mild in handling. So you have to wonder that the problem is more, uh, not so much theological, you know, it's not a, a changing of the good news that Jesus had given Paul to give to them. It was more personality. It was more um, minor, if you will, in, in, in the fellowship of the church. He writes to assure the people that he is well. His situation is this. It's not the best, but it's not the worst yet. He explains why Epaphroditus is leaving Paul and returning to Philippi. He gives the letter to him and and he wants them to know that Epaphroditus, one of the followers who'd come to help Paul in his in his prison time there, um, he he is not coming back to you because he's abandoning me. I'm sending him to you. Uh, and he uses this letter to express his thanks to them for all that they've meant to him. So with all this background, let's dive, if we can, into the first chapter, at least trying to get into some of these verses that are very key. Um, if we look at, and again, my translation of where I've translated is going to be rougher and a little bit different than your translation. So I hope that we can together go through and see some things um, that are there. And just because I translate it doesn't mean it's, it's gee, I should go print my own uh, translation. It was just work that I did with, with the Greek languages. Um, beginning with verses 1 and 2. Paul and Timothy... He says, servants of Jesus Christ to all the saints living in Christ Jesus who live in Philippi, along with the overseers, sometimes you'll see the word bishops and deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Did you hear the second verse that I just gave you? Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's another one. Um, if you've been around me over 20 years and you've had the misfortune of being present in a funeral service that I am leading or a part of, you might recall that is that's the first thing I tell the family at a funeral service. It's what Paul greeted fellow believers in Philippi with, and he felt they needed that uh, blessing, that, that the recognition that Christ is with us. And that's, it's not original with me, it's Paul. It's Paul, and that's where I got that, and that's why I use that all the time. Now, he begins by saying, to all saints who are existing or living. Um, he's writing to the living. He's writing to the saints that are there. Um, it is um, um, a greeting that's very similar to what a Hebrew would write and greet you with, and it kind of combines uh, some of the nuances of both. For example, uh, the word of peace in Hebrew is shalom. And being that Philippi probably has some Hebrews within its fellowship, remember Lydia was, remember a lot of them resettled in that area some 10, 20 years prior uh, after being expelled from Rome. So, you know, they understood what peace was when you, when you bless someone with peace. Now, of course, the other word is grace. And that's really a Greek concept, kairos. Not that there isn't grace in the Old Testament or in the Hebrew, but it becomes a very focal word for Paul's writings and becomes a focal word in what the church believes about God's love for us. Um, he, he talks about the servants of Jesus Christ, slave servants. Um, Paul and Timothy uh, consider themselves the same. Uh, Paul makes all of them servants as status. It's okay to be a servant. And that's good news to this church because the truth is that many of them are servants. And so what they're doing is they're uh, reminding, uh, Paul is reminding the church where you are is a good place. You are loved 
and given grace of God and peace of God, regardless of status that you have. He uses the phrase Christ Jesus twice in, in verse 1 and trying to reference to himself and who he's addressing. Um, and uh, what he's pointing out is, in, is that grace and peace really are not from Paul. They are from God. So when he says grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, it's not Paul saying, I'm blessing you. Paul is reminding them that Christ, that God through Christ is blessing them right now. Um, and so we want to, you know, we want to be uh, understanding of that. There's this threefold salutation at the beginning. He gives the signature. It's Paul and Timothy. Uh, he gives the address. We're going to Philippi. I'm sending this to those of you who live in Philippi. And welcome. This is what I, I, I want you to know that I bring to you in the name of God. It varies with each letter. Uh, sometimes his, um, his signature <laughs> can, get, um, can get long. Um, a lot of people have looked at Paul as boastful in some of his letters because he so many times tells you, I am this, I have been through this for the cause of the gospel. I have been shipwrecked, I have been beaten, I have been stoned, I've been left for dead a number of times. You know, and, and people are like, man, what a braggart. But Paul had to do this a lot of times because in many places where he sent a letter, his apostleship, his authority to, to teach in the name of Christ was being questioned. So oftentimes he felt compelled to bring his credentials out and, and put them there. And be able to say, this is why I can talk to you. Now, in Philippi, doesn't need to do that. He doesn't need to give credentials. Uh, uh, in Rome, in Romans, he does. And that may be because he knows them very little. But it seems the church is sometimes too that he doesn't know as well. He spends credentializing. You know, and in, in, in Philippi, whom he knows extremely well, he doesn't spend a lot of time telling people who you are. In fact, it's almost to me this idea as they read it aloud, if there's new people, new believers in the faith that are there that didn't know Paul, somebody will fill them in <laughs> in a little while. Um, it is um, uh, just different ways that he addresses his letters, and Philippians shows he has this relationship. Uh, so he doesn't need to tell them, hey, look at me, what I've done. Uh, verses 3 through 6 Paul then offers this kind of prayer and thanksgiving, prayer of thanksgiving for the people he's writing to in Philippi. He says, I give thanks to my God. In every remembrance, I think of you. Always in my every prayers, on behalf of all of you, with joy making understood my prayer because you have been partners with me in the gospel from the first day until now i am persuaded i am sure i am certain of this one thing that the one and of course his reference to this is god the one uh having begun a good work among you, within you, will bring it to completion at the day of Christ Jesus. Um, this thanksgiving section uh, carries on. And these verses of 3 through 6 kind of give us this notion of how it has been between Paul and the Philippians. It has been a good relationship. There, after this Thanksgiving, there's this personal nature of prayer that happens. In, 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 in worship planning, we, we sometimes say, here's a congregational prayer of confession. Here is a prayer for the people. Here is, uh, you know, this. Or, and you probably heard the term pastoral prayer. Well, a pastoral prayer is based, just like right here, on the idea of what Paul is doing 
it's scriptural. It, it, we, he is praying for them. The pastor praying for the children of God, for the people of God. And it's interesting, the word for prayer in Greek, um, deesi, is the same word in Greek, uh, a cousin to, if you will, for the word we interpret as need. Ironic, prayer, need. That could preach volumes. Prayer is inclusive. It's done with joy. It's done with, uh, with thanksgiving in our hearts. And the reason for our prayer is their fellowship and partnership, Paul tells them. I'm praying for you because you have been, you know, a part of my faith family and partnered with me in the ministry of Jesus Christ. In fact, in the fourth verse, Paul says there is a joy in Christian prayer. He, he looks at them and he tells them, you know, um, uh, on, on behalf of all of you with joy, I'm making understood my prayer. You know, I sometimes wonder if we lose the joy of our prayer and of our praying. My prayers, your prayers, our prayers can many oftentimes turn out to be um, laments. Lament is something from the heart of anguish, of need, of pain, of want, um, of sorrow. But prayer has to have a place of joy within it. Some of the most joyful people I've ever known in my life were joyful because when I heard them pray, they prayed with joy. No matter what the circumstance. Now, I've shared it many times before, but I, I'm going to do it again. Um, when I first came to North Pamunkey Baptist Church in Orange, Virginia, in 1991, there was an older gentleman whose name was Frank Johnson, and Frank was a, uh, a retired second career minister. In other words, late in his life, he surrendered finally to the call of ministry and eventually became pastor of Enon Baptist Church in uh, Buckham, uh, Buckingham, uh, Virginia. And he stayed there for 13 years. He would have stayed longer, but his, his son, one of his sons, uh, his wife died and left him with three children to, to grow and to nurture. And so Frank and his wife Helen uh, resigned from there and moved to Orange in order to help. And he'd been there for a while and he became like the unsanctioned, unpaid associate pastor of that small church North Pamunkey. Played the organ, was involved in so much, but he visited so many people because the pastoral within him was still there. I told you all that to say that within just a few short weeks of my being there and getting to know Frank, one night we got a call that Frank was in a health crisis and the rescue squad had come. So we hustled over there with his son Carl and at that time his wife Gina and then also with uh, Bill and Trish. Bill was another son. And together we got in our cars and we followed the rescue squad to Charlottesville to Martha Jefferson and we went in and we were sequestered immediately into a family room and within about 10 minutes or 15 they came in to tell us that Frank had died and after the shock of that event and here I am a new pastor to this group of people and I almost always in such a time and moment want people to begin to to share their 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 tears. I think you need to cry. I think you need to weep. Uh, that's why God gives us e these emotions and uh, in order to help cleanse what's hurting in us. And within about three or four, I, I, no more than five minutes, I, I don't even think it was that far, before I could say anything or call everyone to prayer, Helen, his wife, immediately began to just pray. And of course, knowing her well, the boys and the daughter-in-laws and, and us all immediately bowed to listen to her as she prayed. But it was probably the, I mean, this is the man of her life. She had spent, uh, I think they were married 50 some odd years together or more. And um, 
they had, uh, he was dead all within this short period of time of an hour. And in that shock and grief, she said, Lord, thank you. Thank you that I had X number of years with this man. Thank you for the nine children that we had together. And thank you, Lord, for all the blessing. Now, these people were not blessed financially, but they felt blessed by the Spirit of God. And it was the most eloquent prayer of joy in a moment of pain and hurt that I, this still reaches me to this day. Um, we have to recognize that happiness is based on a lack um, and based on our attitudes uh, or a luck. It's, it, happiness is based on luck. Uh, in fact, the, uh, the root for the word hap in Greek is also the word root for the word luck. Um, when people base their happiness on luck or attitude or even feelings, it fails. But joy is not based on luck. It is based on providence or trust in God. It's based on the order of understanding my place within God's work and God's hand, um, that God is still God and God will sustain me in all that I go through. And because of that, whether it is crushing or uplifting, each event brings me the joy of knowing I am not alone. And so Paul is telling them that. That's the way I pray for you. Because I know that I'm not alone. God is with me, and I know God is with you. And what's more, by the power of God, we are with one another. Uh, and in the last verse, verse 6, I'm persuaded of this one thing that that uh the, that God, having begun a good work with you, will bring it to completion the day of Christ Jesus. It shows Paul's confidence in God that will allow him to pray in joy. In other words, we believe, as Paul believed, that our joy springs out of the fact that God is not through with us yet. And by the power of Christ Jesus, we will continue to not only serve him, but praise him. Um, and God will bring everything to its rightful conclusion. Now, we're going to pause here because next week we're going to pick right back up at verses 7 through 11 and, and beyond. And as uh, my dad used to say, make hay while the sun shines. <laughs> next Wednesday, we will um, take a hard look at those verses and, and hopefully find some more that God has in store for us. Please, if you would, remember in prayers... Uh, a lot of our people, uh, Mary Higgins, who is undergoing therapy at King's Grant, and I've been told that her statement is very clear. I don't like it here, but I will do whatever it takes to get me home, uh, which you can see Mary saying. Uh, Doris Mabe, who is at Stanley Town, undergoing um, uh, rehab as well from her surgery, and uh, she too is committed to getting his home as soon as she can. Gail McKinney. Uh, recovering still from her illnesses prior to Christmas. Don Shermer from his leukemia has had good week, good news that he did not need the blood platelets uh, this week, so that was a good thing. Louise Smith, as she continues to rehab at home. Uh, remember the family of Freddie Martin. Uh, I believe the private memorial service or private interment service was today. Our own Lewis Harris was um, officiating that. And uh, we want to keep them in, in our prayers, the Martin family, and of course, Freddie's mother and, and his brother and, and all of that Martin family, if you would, um, and our community. Uh, also, if you'd remember my stepfather, he was diagnosed right at uh, around the 27th, 8th of, um, of December with COVID. Uh, I think he's on the back side of that. But then, lo and behold, Monday, he had a fall. They had to take him to the ER. But thank God there was nothing broken. And so he's back at uh, the uh, lantern wing of Morning Point. And um, uh, it was good to get to see him through the window a few times when we were in. Uh, it wasn't always easy to see, to you know, to, to experience that. But um, I felt very blessed because 
you know, I, uh, my whole family came away feeling like in our visits, you know, to Bruce that um, he didn't recognize us. And, and uh, well, we have masks on, we're looking through a window uh, <laughs> and, and he was very weak and tired, uh, some of those uh, uh, meetings. But on Monday, I got a phone call or Sunday, I think it was somewhere in there. I got a phone call from my mom and we were talking and she mentioned that Bruce had told her on the phone has Mike gone home yet? Hey, what do you know? He knew I was there and I didn't know that he knew. So I, I give uh, joy and thanks to God uh, for that little bit. Let's um, remember one another and lift one another in prayer at this time. Join me if you would. Heavenly Father, I lift before you all the people and all those who are on our hearts today, Lord. We ask, Heavenly Father, that we will live as if the joy of your salvation, the grace of your Son, Jesus Christ, the peace of your Holy Spirit will be with all of us because it is. And because of that, Lord, we give you thanks in all things because you are still working to complete a good thing through your grace in us and through us. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for visiting and uh, this Bible study. We'll, we'll dive into Philippians next week. May you have a blessed week and hope to see you in some form or fashion on Sunday.